All right. Good evening, everyone. It is six o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get started with uh, tonight's meeting to our second neighborhood meeting, rather, to discuss the Jettinger Villas Lot 1 official development plan. Um, my name again is Nathan Lawrence. I'm a senior planner with the city, um, with the community development department. I'll be presenting um, an overview of the applicant's proposal and we'll, and we'll out, outline the steps and development process um, as we move forward. Um, Will, Gla Will Gabler um, is the project architect and he'll be speaking um, after my uh, presentation on behalf of the property owner, Mr. Gourmet Dorji. So before we begin, just some reminders about um, some some etiquette with with the virtual engagement. Please keep your comments courteous and cordial. Um, just remember that the most productive conversation we, we can have starts with respect. Uh, questions and comments will be read aloud to the audience along with the name of the person that made that question or comments. So keep that in mind. Um, and please keep your, your questions and comments relevant to the application that's being considered tonight. Um, if you have any other questions about anything else, of course, we're here to help. Um, we have an email up, up there, <clears throat> which is planning at cityofwestminster.us, um, and you can send any other questions there and they will be answered. And then um, just for more information, um, you, you can, on the city's social media commenting policy, um, you can visit our web page, it's pretty easy to find. So here's tonight's agenda. Um, we'll try to do a quicker presentation for those of you who were, who were here uh, last, last month, um, no more than 15 minutes. Um, we do need to give an, an overview of, of the project in case there are folks here that weren't in attendance last time, um, but we will also review some of the major findings of the first meeting. Um, we'll follow the presentation with questions and comments, um, just like we did last time, and wrap up with um, an explanation of what happens next. Um, and again, just a reminder, the, the meeting will end promptly at 8. So questions and comments, a little bit different tonight. Um, so throughout tonight's presentation, like last time, please enter your comments into the chat box. Um, we got a lot of comments last time um, and um, every response was created um, and included in a summary that was sent to all to everyone who participated in the meeting. Um, we understand that there might be some folks here tonight or joining us later that um, weren't at the first meeting. So we understand if um, there might be some um, redundant questions, that's fine. Um, but um, you know if if you were here and, and a question was already asked, please refrain um, from asking those questions again. And um, you can always reference that summary sheet. Um, since we're holding a second meeting tonight, which isn't our norm, um, but we are doing it again to provide you all with, with an additional chance to provide input into our process, um, we will allow uh, verbal commentary tonight. Um, we'll start with allowing Ben Thurston um, five minutes at the beginning of, of, of the Q&A session to speak. Um, we'll then go through all of the chat comments in order. And then once those are, are finished, uh, then we'll sort of open it up to any verbal comments. So during the night, if you are during the, the, the course of the presentation or after, if you would like to um, speak um, aloud, then just type in, into the chat box, I would like to speak and we'll go in order um, after we go through all of the chat questions. Um, yeah, and that should cover that should cover that. So a little different tonight, but again, we'll let Ben go first, then chat questions, and then verbal. So go ahead and enter into the box if you'd like to speak or just type in your, your question. All right, so we'll go through my pre-presentation. Again, I've, I've, I've tried to shorten it a bit, but I, want, I do want to go over the sort of base information here. The property owner is requesting, is proposing to establish a meditation center in an existing building on the site that's located on the southeast corner of 106 and Balsam. Um, and that's addressed at um, 
West uh, 8200 West 106th Avenue. Back in January 28th, 2020, City Council uh, voted to approve the preliminary development plan. Um, the PDP, as we'll be referring to it tonight, um, allowed for the establishment of a meditation center and also included uh, setbacks, um, some restrictions on the size of buildings um, and height restrictions. Uh, the, the, the PDP also um, um, set some some regulations for accessory uses such as parking, circumambulation path, a prayer wheel wall, and so forth. Here's an overview of our uh, development review and permitting process. Um, so we're now at the um, official development plan application stage here in the middle. Um, we've gone through our first review by staff which places us um, at the neighborhood meeting stage, which is where this um, always occurs. Um, so um, the, the ODP or the official development plan is really the entitlement document that sets forth these specific site and building design standards um, and really forms the, the basis for approval of building permits and civil um, docs. Um, so again, we've com completed the first review, which brings us to uh, tonight's second neighborhood meeting. So again, with the ODP, um, we're looking, we're, we're starting to get into a more fine grain, and we would like your comments on these items. Um, so we're really talking tonight about um, try trying to get feedback on site access, on the landscape design, parking lot design, uh, site dra drainage and lighting. Uh, architecture and signage. You'll see some some images in in the applicant's presentation that will give you an idea of the project. But please keep your comments focused on these um, because these are the items that um, we need your feedback on and can influence the outcome of the final project. So I want to give a quick summary of the first meeting. Um, So this last month, we really went through a great deal of, uh, of, of input. Um, and I thank you all who are here for your feedback. Um, I've summarized a few of those items um, and I'll just go, go, I'll go through them. Um, again, just, just so we, we can continue to talk about fresh topics. Um, so first off, um, only those development restrictions that are listed on the PDP are applicable to review of the ODP. Um, a great deal of community input was received at the council meeting back in January 2020. Um, it actually spanned two nights um, in order um, to accommodate all of the requests to, uh, to, to provide feedback. At the end of the process, um, staff was not directed to add any stipulations to the, to the PDP document. Um, and, it, and it was approved by city council as it was presented. Second, the city uh, does not have a noise ordinance. There were some questions on that. Um, instead, um, complaints are handled um, sort of one-off based on, on, on um, if someone phones in to the uh, police to complain about them. Um, third, the temple use and meditation center use are both allowable uses per the PDP. Uh, church use is what's stated on the PDP under the list of primary uses. Um, but that was listed there because it matched the closest um, um, use that was listed on the comprehensive plan. But uh, church use also means temple, uh, um, and in this case, also a meditation center. Uh, fourth, uh, the city has a very well-defined process for special events, but please be aware that there are other accessory uses that are associated with the principal use that are not subject to that process. That said, we are going to going. We've heard all of your input on that, and we will continue to work with the applicant to define the the, the appropriate thresholds for when a special event permit is required. Um, and based on the unique operations of this uh, of this center, um, so again, we will take your uh, your comments into consideration as we as we go forward. Um, acknowledging this is kind of new ground for us, and so we're going to. Um, 
weigh both the needs of the center and the community feedback in that. Uh, fifth, a prayer wheel wall is allowed per the, per the PDP. Um, it, it can only be 10 feet tall. Um, the meditation center building um, can also, is limited to 30 feet in height, which includes the uh, spine. So nothing will exceed that 30 foot height plane. And then finally, uh, 21 off street parking spaces are required by our code at minimum, but the applicant is, is it is proposing to add extra spaces um, to better handle the parking demand. They can cover that in their in their portion of the of the pre, of the presentation, uh, which begins now. So, Will Gabler um, is an architect who is going to present the owner's um, proposal for development of of the center. Um, again, you know, feel free to enter questions into the chat box um while he's going through just so that they stay fresh and uh with that i will turn it over to will all right um thanks nathan um we'll just quickly kind of go through these um i think you know most people here should be fairly familiar with the project by now but just as a quick review um here's a this slide's an aerial view showing the existing site um you can see 106 um, kind of at the top left, balsam there at the bottom. Um, next slide. Another um, satellite view of the site with the existing buildings. Um, you can see the single family um, home uh, labeled number two there at the center. Um, four is the um, former garage, which is uh, remodeled and proposed to be the new location of the meditation center. Next slide. Um, we wanted to kind of address some of the concerns that came up at last meeting um, that um, some people felt like the um, project that was presented to city council was um, substantially different than what we were presenting. So I just wanted to show those side by side so that people could see, um, you know, the general size and scale and scope of the project um, is essentially the same. But as, as the process goes um, at the ODP stage, um, you know, we're asked to develop color and detail in the architecture to kind of present the character of that um and get uh you know public feedback on that so um you know this image is um hopefully kind of shows that um what we're presenting hasn't changed greatly from what we, we were showing at the city council meeting um and um you know this these images show kind of the next stage of development as we work with the city to kind of take it to the next level. Next slide. This is the proposed site plan. Um, and we, we added some square footage calculations um, as they were requested last time um, to show uh, parking area, um, the existing 30 by 30 structure um, will not be enlarged so that um, enclosed space will remain at 900 square feet. Um, there's the addition of a covered deck, um, prayer wheel roof, um, it's roughly 1,500 square feet, um, and the path, um, the concrete path that will be supportive of that is roughly 2,500 square feet. Um, the parking uh, area, as it's currently laid out is just under 7,000 square feet. Um, you know, as, as Nathan was saying, as we develop this with, um, you know, the, the engineered plan drawings, we were constrained within the setbacks. We may try to uh, add a couple additional stalls, um, you know, within those constraints, um, just so that we maximize the total number at that location so that uh, you know there's less need for 
any kind of overflow parking, which we'll, we'll discuss in later slides. And then um, we included um, <clears throat> just some general site um, area calcs, um, just to see the amount of um, development we're proposing in context of the overall site. Um, you know, approximately 8% of the site, um, you know, will be uh, developed in terms of what's already existing and uh, including the proposed drive and parking area. Um, so the, that leaves, you know, approximately 92% of the site will be left as um, undeveloped field or landscaped um, areas. This is a, is a way to get some context on, um, you know, the scale of the development. Next slide. These are just some rendering views. Um, we had some feedback about um, making sure that there's uh, substantial evergreen planting um, with the buffer, um, which we'll, we'll be developing that with the landscape architect, just to ensure that that screenage um, for the parking area um, that is uh, screened um, year round. Next slide. Again, another view from 106th Avenue facing south. Next slide. And they're uh, pro we're proposing a um, some kind of automatic gate at the entrance. Um, this is just for reference, not not necessarily this design, but something similar, um, just to control access after hours and that type of thing um, and to create you know kind of a more formal entry um, to the, the site and the project. Next slide. Um, this shows um, based on the um, kind of current Westminster signage code um, the scale of site signage um, that's allowed for residential areas um, that's restricted to um, six feet in height and a total area of 12 square feet. Um, and we're proposing um, putting some sort of sign, maybe not this design, but something similar um, to, to mark the entrance um, for visitors coming in. Next slide. This is a view from the parking area. Um, you can see we're, we're talking with the city. We'll, we'll kind of get into it a little bit more when we discuss drainage, but we're looking at um, various systems to control um, water on the site um, and mitigate um, you know, site drainage. Um, and we're looking at potentially using a permeable paper system for the parking lot as one of the strategies um, towards that end. Next slide. This is just a zoomed in view um, showing a little bit more detail of the prayer wheel wall. You can see the, the prayer wheels um, are, are copper cylinders um, there at the center. Um, I think we kind of explained how those work. Um, just to reiterate, they're, they're not intended um, and designed to, to make no, no sound. Um, um, and, and they're used, um, people will be circumambulating along the path um, and spinning those as they circumambulate around the, the prayer wheel walls. Next slide. It's just a view of the interior court. Um, you know, this is kind of a sheltered informal area that, um, you know, as we work with the landscape architect, 
Uh, this will just be developed as kind of an informal gathering area for um, people. Uh, um, you know, when weather's nice, they can um, gather or take breaks outside. Um, you know, between um, uh, events at the at the retreats or, or whatever. Next slide. And this is again the view from the south, um, looking at the the front of the um, meditation building. Um, you can see the covered porch area um, and the the front entry doors. Um, the the prayer walls uh, around the perimeter. Next slide. So I just wanted to kind of summarize um, some of the key neighborhood concerns that we heard at last meeting. Um, just, I think it's kind of been expressed, but just wanted to reiterate um, that, you know, we're working closely with the um, city and county um, engineers um, and looking at different strategies to mitigate um, site drainage. Um, and our, our goal is, is to um, maintain or improve historical flow patterns to neighbors' properties. So um, our goal is that the development we do um, is an improvement to drainage um, on the property. Um, and then in terms of neighborhood fit, um, you know, we worked through this process um, with a lot of iterations on and what we we're proposing um, and work with the planning officials to um, implement height uh, limits and setbacks um, so that the scale and the scope of the project um, would be consistent with um, you know the, the existing um, context of the neighborhood um, and and again part of that um, results in a development that um, only uh, impacts about 8% of the site, um, or is that 92% of the site is left to um, you know, undeveloped fields or landscaped areas. And then, um, as I said before, um, you know, we'll be developing the specifics of that landscape buffer with our landscape architect, but will likely include um, earth berms and evergreen plantings, just to ensure that that, that um, the opacity and the screening of that uh, screen will be maintained year round. Next slide. Um, and so as the, the previous slide that showed kind of the entry um, signage. There was um, a lot of feedback that um, the neighbors typically weren't interested in the larger um, kind of arch entryway, um, and so we're we're taking out that off the table for now. Um, and but and so that any signage that we're proposed will be um, conformed to those requirements. Um, for residential areas, as I indicated before. So we're talking to the city about um, overflow parking. Um, you know, there's lots of concern about um, parking and potentially people parking on 106. Um, and our strategy is um, to uh, concentrate um, all our parking kind of in the area we indicated if we can squeeze a couple more spots in there just to um, uh, increase the uh, capacity for parking there um, we'll do that and then our strategy for any overflow parking will be directed within the the um, parking setbacks setbacks um, from the PDP um, within that, that area on the western part of the site um, will be dedicated for um, any kind of overflow parking if that arises.
Um, and so in terms of road improvements, we're, we're working closely with Jefferson County um, in conversations about um, what improvements they'd like to see for both 106th Avenue and Balsam. Um, and so our, our last conversation, um, they said they would like to see some type of um, sidewalk uh, on the, you know, adjacent to our property along both 106th and Balsam Street. Um, and we're talking to them about the appropriateness of, of perhaps um, using a um, kind of more informal path um, to satisfy that requirement um, rather than a concrete sidewalk. Um, but we're still kind of fleshing that out with them um, to see what's uh, appropriate. Uh, I think that's I think that's my last slide. All right, uh, thank you, Will. Um, so we will uh, we'll shift into Q and A. Um, we were going to start with allowing uh, Ben Thurston to speak. Uh, so uh, Jennifer, can you um, unmute Ben, and we'll allow him to speak for uh, for five minutes, um, and then we'll turn back to uh, the uh, the uh, chat comments. We have quite a few that have come in already. Sure, Nathan. Mr. Thurston, you are allowed to speak. Oh, there we go. Now it's unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, sure can. Okay, great. Um, thanks, Nathan. Uh, first, I need to make it clear that my comments that I'm about to make are not meant to be an exhaustive list of neighbor concerns, and I certainly don't speak for all of the neighbors. Having said that, from my perspective, there are three broad categories of concerns by the neighbors regarding the proposed ODP. Number one is that the neighbors want the applicant to honor the representations he made during the public hearing for the PDP. These were provided to the city staff, but the response was, and you heard it tonight, that they could not be added to the PDP or ODP because council did not specifically make them conditions of approval. However, we have reviewed the statements made by council members just prior to the PDP vote, and we found that at least some of them relied on the applicant's representations to explain their vote in favor of the application. But it ultimately comes down to the applicant, and honoring these commitments is the right thing to do, and it's what someone does when they truly want to be a good neighbor. And I'm just going to run through them real quick. We've, we asked these questions last time, but this is what, we, and we didn't make these up, we found these in the testimony. Uh, during the public hearing. Um, so they're, they're written in the form of, of conditions. So the building shall have a maximum occupancy of 45 people. Number two, accessory buildings shall be for residential use only and, for church, and not for uh, church use of any type. Number three, the parking lot for the church shall not exceed 17 spaces. We heard that uh, from Nathan that 21 spaces at least are required, but I'm sure that the, the Westminster's code allows for adjustments to parking in one way or another, whether administrative or some kind of relief process uh, to allow fewer if that is all that's needed. Number four, the church may host a maximum of five retreats per year with a maximum attendance of 45 people per retreat. Again, we clearly heard that in the hearing. Number five, any special event that is anticipated to exceed 45 people shall be conducted off site. And number six, the building shall have a maximum area of 1,000 square feet. That's already on the PDP. But uh, to go on to say that the applicant represents that 1,000 square feet is adequate for its church program. OK, so that's the first broad category. Honor your commitments. Number two, uh, the county has identified two types of offsite improvements. First is the improvement of adjacent roadways. Second is the requirement to convey storm water to the nearest storm sewer or drainage way. The neighbors want to make sure that these issues are being addressed with this applicant in the same way that they would be addressed with any other applicant. We know the applicant has requested relief from the county for road improvements. The narrow roads and the fact that pedestrians are forced to walk in the road was talked about extensively in the public hearing. 
But now that there is a trail through the open space, the pedestrian activity has of course increased. When pedestrians are on the road, two cars cannot pass each other at the same time. There is a significant safety issue and it's growing. Ideally, the applicant should be required to improve their frontage to at least make the safety issues a little bit better. Regarding drainage, it appears that conveying storm water to the nearest storm sewer or drainage way would be challenging for the applicant. What we thought we heard from the city's drainage engineer is that some kind of alternative is being considered that would not require the conveyance that Jefferson County says is required. It would be very helpful if both the city's engineer and the county's engineer would provide a direct answer to the question of whether or not the applicant will be required to convey storm water offsite. And the third category uh, is finally, at the last meeting, the applicant showed a number of new additions to his proposal that were not included in the PDP, most notably a few different options for a gateway to the property. The Westminster Code states that the city manager will decide if these changes constitute a significant change that warrants additional public hearings. The neighbors wanna make sure that any of the changes they saw at the last meeting will require public hearings for approval of an amendment to the PDP. Again, that's the right thing to do given the sensitivity of the neighbors, given what we went through in the public hearing, given that it was a, a split vote by council. Uh, for all those reasons, if there's, if there's changes, it really should go back to public hearings. And that's all I've got for you, Nathan, uh, Nathan thanks. Okay, thank you, Ben. Uh, appreciate that. I appreciate how organized you were in giving that. Um, I, I was jotting down a few of these questions. I think some of them are um, were also asked in the just looking ahead in the chat. So I'd like to kind of take a few of these um, and see if we can address them or at least have a response to them. Again, you know, the purpose of this meeting is to is to collect your feedback. So um you know we can't answer exactly how everything is going to happen now that's why we're holding this meeting at this early early stage in, in the development process um but some of these i think are um we can address um with what our next steps are going to be um if not more um i remember i so in the first category i remember hearing that the um uh 45 is the max max occupancy um, that is the occupancy that's going to be for the building. Um, so that's that's pretty set. Um, let's see, the parking lot minimum. So the city has a minimum parking requirements. Um, and so 21s are minimum and parking can be provided over that. Um, so if there was a commitment to 17, that would be um, in conflict with our with our parking minimums. And also um, that comment is a is sort of in conflict with you know a lot of the comments from the community where we've heard that there's a concern that they don't want people parking on the road so i think um you know and and we can talk about this more but um you know those two comments seem to be at odds because i, I think by providing the inadequate number of parking on site to meet the needs for the 900 square foot facility which was approved makes some sense so that there aren't cars parked on the street because we definitely heard that that was a big concern so um you know i think having the parking on site and, and and fully screened um that meets the needs of that facility um i think could address um any kind of fear of parking of spilling out onto the roadways um and then yeah we have a lot of good a lot of good questions about about uh storm drainage and um and um, the sidewalk requirements we actually have uh, both um, Charles Kudlis with um, Jeffco County and Nathan Ank with with the uh, city both are uh, excellent engineers and so I'll um I guess you know speaking to I guess we can kind of bundle those both together because both were topics covered in the in the um, response to the request for relief so I see Nathan's got his camera up and Charles. Um, Nathan, uh, do you want to kind of go, or maybe actually let's start with Charles because with sort of Jeffco, he's dealing with a lot of the offsite impacts. And then we'll go to Nathan, just talking about both the, what's expected from the applicant as far as drainage, um, you know, what's going to flow, what will be allowed, if anything, to flow, to be conveyed offsite, and then what sort of sidewalk requirements are expected. Uh, Charles? Yeah, sure. Um, 
Thanks, Nathan. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Charles. I'm civil planning engineer with Jefferson County. Um, so just a quick overview. We, you know, basically how how this process works between governmental agencies. Um, you know, the proper so the property is located within the city of Westminster, but the adjoining right of way, um, as you probably all may already know, is within Jefferson County right of way. And so we, you know, when when an application comes in, a development application. Um, you know, to coordinate with other agencies, City of Westminster will send an outside agency referral to the county, and we basically review that. Um, and and then we look so such as like the drainage report that gets submitted, or the proposed improvements for the development. You know, the county looks at those things, and really we're just looking to make sure that our regulations are being met, um, especially within the county right of way. Um, you know, the drainage is kind of a a different um kind of a unique issue but we do or situation but we do review um our requirements and then in certain instances we can either provide our recommendations or um you know or in the case where we're talking about conveyance over other people's properties especially properties within unincorporated jefferson county you know we would have an interest in that and we would we and then we then could require items there so i think there was there's some confusion um you know I, I think a little bit of confusion on that so you know there was mention of you know the the county is basically the county and the city needs to be clear on whether drainage conveyance is going to be a requirement or not so really that is kind of dependent on the design the drainage plan which is you know designed by the developer you know the county the city we don't we don't design the um plans for the the developer they provide their plans to us and then we review it and we tell them well this you know whether this is meeting our requirements or not so we can't we can't necessarily require them to convey any water anywhere, but if they, you know, in this case, you know, the drainage plan, the current drainage plan provided uh, a detention pond to address detention and then and water quality requirements. So with a detention pond, you're based, the idea behind that detention pond is you're detaining water and, and you want to release that water, ultimately um, trying to match historical rates. So you know, if this site were not developed, which it's not now, you know, that's the historical drainage pattern that we are trying to match with. Now you're adding in all this impervious area, which is going to create, uh, you know, concentrated stormwater runoff. Ultimately, that all goes to a detention pond. And so the county requirement as far as conveyance is, okay, that detention pond is going to outfall somewhere. Like that is going to, that that water that's being released at historical rates or or close to historical rates needs to go somewhere so the requirement as far as conveyance where that comes from is you know the county likes to see with detention ponds that that outfall um you know that that water is released to a nearby either major drainage way or maybe if there were underground um uh, stormwater infrastructure such as storm sewer pipes you know it would it would maybe drain into there um, so but really it's it's kind of dependent on the design so the alternatives that are coming into play are um, you know if there was not a detention pond um, you know then the alternatives uh, to address stormwater runoff in other ways I mean there are other ways besides detention and so that's kind of where the um, where it becomes a, you know, I don't know, you know, it, we don't know because the design may change. Um, so I hope that kind of answers the drainage question. Um, you know, as far as like, if the plan, if the design, you know, incorporates a detention pond and we want to see, you know, that, that it would be the county requirement. We, you know, the current plan showing that outfall to the Southern property uh, of this property, you know, you know, we would want to see, um, how how is that conveyed to the major drainage way? And if that is conveyed to a major drainage way, then obviously that's going to require some drainage easements, you know, because you can't just 
you know, cross convey water through other people's property without their permission, right? So, so you know, the county, the city is fully aware of that. And so, um, you know, I hope that answers that part of the question. The second part, uh, you know, involving right of way improvements. So, the applicant did provide, uh, you know, a request for relief from certain requirements that that we like to see um, as far as improvements. Um, the county processed that, we reviewed that, and um, we've already notified the applicant. They have our comments. Basically, the county county staff is not supportive of the request for relief from providing um, sidewalk, which um, you know that that kind of falls in with our template standards for streets. I mean, basically how it how the county operates um, for improvements is when a development comes in, you know, the county typically requires that one half of the adjoining street that fronts the property, you know, meets our template standards. So if it's a local street that adjoins the property, then we want to make sure that that half of the street meets our local street template. So our local street template, you know, there, there are three different local street templates that the county has, but, you know, obviously they all have sidewalk, um, and so, because of pedestrian connectivity um, and, you know, plans for, you know, potential trails along Balsam Street, you know, the county would like to see sidewalk. Um, and, and then as far as curb and gutter, we do support the, them not providing curb and gutter because, um, you know, just based on the drainage plans, it you know it just doesn't make sense to have curb and gutter um and so for them to for us to make it a requirement um uh, you know it, it just doesn't make sense if if the plans were to change where maybe curb and gutter helped uh alleviate drainage issues then you know maybe we would circle back on that but you know that based on the historic drainage patterns of the site if you look at the contours of the site you know the site generally drains from um, you know, the northeast there down to the southeast kind of, and that's kind of where that, you know, that detention pond may come from that location. Um, but since then, you know, we've, we've provided them comments for, for drainage, uh, relating to drainage concerns and to the, and to the request for relief. And so we're continuing to work with them to resolve those items, but yeah, sidewalk, we do want to see, and, as far as what those sidewalks would look like, I think we would probably, you know, speaking with the other county staff, um, we would probably want to see those sidewalk standards meet the same standards that that CDOT would require. Um, you know, CDOT has MNS standards for sidewalk, curb and gutter, ADA ramps. You know, all those items we would probably want um, those to match. So. That was a very long-winded answer. I think I'm done. <laughs> yeah, Charles. Um, that was that was great. I mean, I think that uh, for the most part, uh, the city is you know really in lockstep here now with the county. And now that we have um, you know a really more flushed out scope of work, um, that that drainage analysis um, and those right of way improvements can all be better flushed out um, in the next few submittals. Um, you know, the one thing that I do want to add um, um, that Mr. Thurston kind of brought up was um, this is absolutely being reviewed um, with against the same exact standards of uh, any development coming in the city of a similar uh, scope, um, you know, as far as imperviousness and increase in impervious area and items such as that. Um, you know, what, what we do shoot for is providing uh, the water quality capture volume. Uh, Basically, what we want is to see that that volume treated and then released matching or um, below the historic rates. So anything that um, this development is adding or incorporating um, that we're reviewing um, within the, the drainage report is, is going to be held to those all those same standards as, as any other development here within the city. Um, and, and, you know, as we move this thing forward, um, you know, Charles, uh, myself and, and Nathan, um, you know, we're going to be coordinating to, to ensure that we're um, enforcing all of um, the, the intricacies of this, um, this development into, into one plan. Um, it, is, it is a little bit of a, um, a hard one to, to kind of 
sort through and we understand that. And I think that, um, you know, as we, you know, develop the, the actual engineering of this plan and move forward into that, um, we're really going to need to see, or we're going to start to see some, um, you know, some big improvements out there as to what we can uh, you know, accommodate and, you know, as far as what we can push on a, on a development this size. So um, we're, we're playing with those or we're, we're judging those um, criteria against um, our stormwater drainage manual um, that's available on our website. Um, so if anybody's interested in that, um, that's, that's an available resource um, that, that we review all of these development redevelopments um, against to ensure that everything is kind of held to the same standards, um, you know, on the same scale. Right. Thanks, guys. A lot of a lot of good information there. Um, so just kind of to wrap up, um, at least the you know the sort of highlights of of, of Mr. Thurston's comments. Um, the third category category was really about adding anything. Um, you know, as this project goes forward from the very early PDP stage and the site the yeah, site plan is developed and the architecture is further developed. Um, you know, it's pretty typical to have um, some some changes to that. I know that there was a lot of um, attention paid to the sort of large gateway um, at the entrance. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'll let the applicant speak to that. Um, I'll, I'm sorry, I'll let Will speak to that. But um, I can comment that as far as the sign code is required, um, our sign code currently allows small scale signage in residential areas. Um, same if you had a sort of like a small a small business, a home office type thing. Um, so we're really, um, you know, after kind of hearing the feedback um, from the last meeting, um, you know, we're still going to stick with with the sort of sign code that's applicable here. Um, something along the lines of what was shown in the presentation. Um, but I'll let uh, Will, if you could just speak to the sort of gateway um, idea um and, and and where your 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 client is at this stage on that right um yeah so so part of the process you know as we we were kind of working through developing and and discussing the entryway um uh you know uh it was proposed that you know at some point um they would like to have kind of a more traditional archway um we weren't sure if that was even feasible um, but uh, after Nathan's encouragement, um, you know, to to uh, present it, um, get feedback, and then at least um, it gives the neighbors an opportunity to um, voice an, an opinion about it. So, um, you know, in, in in feedback from the neighbors and um, in discussion with Nathan, um, it seemed like um, it was. Uh, probably difficult to um, go back and get that amend amendment um, put in to the PDP, um, and so at this point in time, um, we're we're kind of taking that off the table um, and just proceeding um, with the current PDP, um, and then any signage would just conform to the uh, Westminster sign signage code um, for residential areas. Great, thanks, Will. Yeah, I just want to say, I mean, this is kind of unique because we're having two back-to-back -back meetings to actually kind of see the the proposal evolve. But this is exactly what we're trying to get. So that was very helpful feedback. You know, we didn't put the sort of archway up there um, just to kind of rile everyone's feathers. It was really to say, to, to ask the question: Is this appropriate? Um, is it something that you guys would like or not like? And we got feedback on that. And I think we've already sort of reacted to that and a short a short period of time and got that got that input so that's exactly the type of input that we want and we're trying to air any ideas now because this is really um you know the last sort of major stage um to allow for that 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 uh, public input um so thanks again will for for answering to that um i think now we'll and um we'll pivot to um questions in the chat box quite a few and um, John McConnell, principal planner with the city, um, is going to read through them. And um, some of them, I believe, we've we've 
address, I was trying to sort of capture by having both of our engineer, or both um, our engineer and um, and Charles with Jeffco answer that. Hopefully it, it, it sort of ticks some boxes or address some of, of those comments. Um, you know, I'll, I'll pull them back in if I think that there's questions in there that weren't really answered. Um, and if we missed anything, please uh, type into the chat box, you know, if, um, you know, if, if we need to follow up on that and we'll, and we'll do that. So uh, I'll hand it over to John. He'll start going through the, through the comments and questions. Thanks, Nathan. So the uh, first is a comment from Dan Henderson. Uh, why is the petitioner asking for relief from putting, putting in sidewalks and gutters when we are all using the Overland Trail open space more and cars can't pass one another on 106th while we are walking there? And it's a safety hazard because of 106th being so narrow. The applicant is asking for relief from improving the roads, especially 106th Avenue. Most of the neighbors are now using the Overland Trail open space north of 106th Avenue and west of the petitioner's property. 106th Avenue is very narrow, and when we are walking down 106th Avenue, if there are cars coming in both directions, one must stop and pull to the side so the other can pass safely and not endanger the pedestrian. Once the meditation center is in full operation, the traffic will be dramatically increased and the safety of pedestrians is compromised. The petitioner must be required to widen the road along their property line and put in curb and gutter to protect the pedestrian. Yeah, so that's um, a great question from Dan, who um, you know, just lives just south of there. Um, you know, I think, I think you know, the request was made, um, as was the applicant's you know, uh, right to, to ask Jeffco for relief. It was really um, to a number of items. Um, and one that Charles explained wasn't granted was the, the relief from sidewalks on both Balsam and 106. So um, we still need to vet out what those look like, if they're an, an attached sidewalk or sort of trail scenario um, um, that's detached. Um, you know, that would sort of tie in with future plans for other trails in the area. Um, but I think I think we've, we've kind of addressed that. There will be sidewalks in, in some form. Again, we just started talking about this on Monday. Um, so um, we're going to vet um, some, some, some options that also, um, you know, can work with the sort of overall drainage plan, as, as Charles was talking about as well. Um, I guess, Charles, is there anything that you would like to add? I guess we'll I guess we'll, we'll we'll keep moving. I think that pretty much answers it. Dan, if, if there's anything else um, that we that you know it, it isn't addressed, feel feel free to type in some another question. Thanks. Okay, the next is a comment from Marsha Hooker. With the expected snow over the weekend, it will become very visible that we have drainage issues already in the area. It was stated last meeting that no additional requirements would be needed for the temple even though a large parking area will only further runoff. Uh, yeah, uh, John, can you read the next one as well? I think it's very similar. And that, then I see that Charles popped okay. up. I think there's a couple of drainage ones that he can talk to you. All right. <laughs> and so the next one is from Dan Henderson. Uh, site drainage is a huge concern and issue. Um, in 2012 and 2013, the properties below the subject property flooded due to heavy rains. The homeowners in this area will make changes to drainage to protect their properties. The addition of this mass of parking and people will only exacerbate the problem. Yeah, I mean, um, I'll let Charles expand, but um, there will be drainage improvements on site. Um, so any kind of, um, there won't be any additional flooding, um, you know, caused by this project, but I'll let Charles and, and Nathan, um, if they need to add anything to their, their last comments, Charles. Yeah. Sorry. From the last question, I, I was trying to speak, um, and, uh, and I was muted. Can you guys hear me now? Yes. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> so from the last question, they had mentioned curb and gutter as kind of a buffer. Um, so I just wanted to point out, so curb and gutter you know, it's not, it's not, um, the purpose of curb and gutter isn't necessarily 
to provide buffer along streets. Um, you know, that's mostly for drainage um, to convey. I mean, usually streets are kind of used as open channels to convey stormwater runoff. Um, you know, and and that curb and gutter kind of provides that that channelization of that flow. You know, there's no curb and gutter throughout this vicinity. Um, for buffering, for for protection of of pedestrians along sidewalks, usually that's why we see the detached sidewalks. Um, so you'll have some grass buffering um, to kind of protect pedestrians from that traffic. But we typically use that, uh, or we kind of see that more often on higher class roads like uh, major collector streets or or you know streets where you're going to see a lot more traffic. Maybe the speed limits are a lot higher. Um, you know these are kind of local streets so um you know may not make sense um but yeah so just to answer that and then as far as drainage goes uh, i think i kind of spoke kind of to it already i mean basically the the you know the review of, of any development project um that goes through i'm sure any governmental agency that's that's the general big picture concept of kind of what we're um, kind of ensuring is that um, the historical drainage patterns are being uh, matched um, as closely as possible with the design. And so that's why you have, you know, a detention pond or, you know, other design alternatives. And so I don't know if Nathan wants to speak more on that, but. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll jump in on that. And I mean, yes, I mean, there's, there's obviously, um, you know, as, as the citizens out here have mentioned to us um, in, in this meeting and the previous one, um, you know, some background historic um, concerns um, in this area and what is going to happen with the increase in this parking lot, um, this development is going to have to mitigate um, for that increase, treat for water quality, and then release those flows under the historic rate. So anything, any improvement that they're proposing, um, they are going to be making the um, flows from that associated with that better than the um, historic condition. Um, you know, what's happening elsewhere um, on this large site, um, you know, that is a historic, um, uh, drainage flow um, and that that's not really these guys responsibility to um, solve um, on the downstream end what they're going to do is they're going to um, do everything they can to improve um, what is currently happening there but and you know make it that a little bit better but they cannot go out there and solve um, you know the sheet flow coming through their property that they're that they're receiving um, that's coming from the north that continues through this property that continues to the south that ultimately ends up in that major drainage way. Um, so, you know, there is, there's these background flows, these off-site flows that this site is also receiving that are going through their site, um, you know, that, that are impacting the downstream folks. So, you know, those flooding incidents that, was, that um, the neighborhood is experiencing, you know, this property is also experiencing, um, you know, and, and, to be, you know, frank and honest with uh, the 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 neighborhood here, I have uh, two projects on my list to go and review during the snowstorm because this is going to be a very good uh, um, screenshot of what the real characteristics and the real nature of the flows and the runoff is, um, you know, in comparison to you know a a report and and some numbers. So, um, you know, that that is something that I am. Um, you know, personally going to be doing, uh, you know, video, um, you know, send it to me. Uh, love to see it. You know, that that's going to, you know, at least give us an idea as the, the city um, and the county as to uh, where where we have drainage and flooding issues um, and, and where where maybe it's not the developer um, that or the applicant or the um, petitioner's responsibility to to fix and and so <clears throat> this could be an opportunity for us to to help engage with the neighborhood as well. Great, thanks guys again. I really appreciate that. That added some good um, extra color to that to that to your answers before. Um, so John, yeah, where you want to keep going from where we left off? 
Yes, next comment is from Marsha Hooker. This is a meditation center with no expectation of growth. So why advertise with a large signage? The address and name should suffice. Yeah, so as I mentioned, um, you know, th thank you for that, for that input. Um, we do have a new sign code that's in place. And so we'll be looking to that to, um, to permit um, you know, signage, um, which again is, is, generally is, is, is permitted separately from the building permit that has the ODP on it. So, um, so we'll be looking to that, to, uh, to the, the, the ODP to sort of lay out, you know, the location and dimensions um, based on what's allowed in, um, you know, a single family neighborhood like this um, to keep it, um, it at an appropriate scale and one that, you know, other citizens in, in the neighborhood could, could put up by right. So, John? Okay, the next is a question from Bernard Goches. Um, and I'll give a shot at answering this one. Uh, we are concerned about the residential home being utilized as a business and entertainment for temple and meditation center. What measures will be taken to assure the home does not become the business building and use and hours of use? So um, it, it, it looks like there's a concern about the hours of operation that kind of ties back to the other concerns about noise and, and other nuisances. Right now, the official development plan does not have any restrictions on the hours of operation. Um, this is the kind of information that we would be interested in getting your opinion on. Um, Bernard, if you could uh, maybe add something to the chat later on in the chain, uh, give us your ideas about what you think appropriate hours of operation would, would be that uh, that are conducive to uh, maintaining consistency with your neighborhood. And we, we'd be happy to receive those comments. Um, the next comment is from Dan Henderson. Uh, Dan says, this does not fit in our neighborhood. No spires, no prayer wheel walls, and no signage. Uh, another comment from Dan Henderson, Westminster completely disregarded the neighbors that reside in Jefferson County. You only look at the residents of Westminster. Um, next comment is from Shelley Goches. We are not interested in any signage of any size. Next comments from Marsha Hooker. Um, and it's a question, why, ro why road improvement on Balsam? There is no entrance or traffic that should be on this road. Yeah, so I think Marsh is asking, why are we doing any improvements on Balsam? So um, again, you know, we're hearing kind of comments on both sides that, you know, there should be improvements to deal with, um, you know, the increased uh, pedestrian usage. Um, and we're hearing that from a lot of folks. So I think, I think um, you know, both of us kind of address that, that we will be putting um, in some kind of, uh, you know, sidewalk or footpath um, along Balsam to, again, um, to, to more safely convey uh, pedestrian and and and, and trail and trail users, um, and uh, there won't be an entrance on on Balsam. It's proposed on 106. So uh, I think that answers it. But Marcia, if I didn't get to it, please feel free to chat um, to enter a chat again. Okay. The uh, next comment is from Dan Henderson. Uh, this will turn into a nightmare for the city and the residents of this neighborhood. Next is a question from Stan Mack. Why is overflow parking even allowed when only a set number of spots was approved and only 45 people can be there? Yeah, so um, Stan, a uh, um, set number of spots was not approved. Um, the PDP um, does not establish um, any uh, parking minimums or maximums. Um, the minimum parking is, um, as I mentioned before, required by code based on um, the number of people expected to be um, using or accessing the uh, via site. Um, so um, as far as overflow parking, it's really just a concept that we're in the early stages of talking about because we've heard from you all and the community on multiple occasions that um, you guys don't wanna see parking on the street. 
um, because we all we definitely heard that it's a it's a narrow street, and um, we you know that there's that there's concerns for for pedestrian safety. So um, the idea here is that when there when there is a, a, a sort of special event or something um, of that nature that might draw more folks, um, we were we're entertaining the idea. And again, we have to vet this through um, our engineering folks and our traffic engineer um, just to see if there's um, you know a good solution that might allow some overflow parking on site. Um, just for those occasional events, again, to avoid any situations that, you know, have been um, an issue in, in this neighborhood, um, dealing with the other temple that's down, down the street with um, people parking on the roads and making it unsafe. So, um, again, we're just sort of, that's a, the overflow parking is a response to um, what a majority of folks in the neighborhood have, have commented on. Um, and so that's why we are exploring it. Okay, the next is a question from Dan Henderson. Will the applicant be responsible for paying for the police presence required due to this proposal? Um, it, it's unclear to me what the police presence required would be uh, if, if this is in relation to nuisance calls. Um, I'm not sure that they, there is a, a, a mechanism to charge back a property owner for that, but but Dan, we may have to check in with our police department to see if there's a, a clearer answer on that one. And also, if we've misinterpreted the question, please let us know uh, further in the chat, and we'll we'll try to clarify the John, answer. But it's likely going to require them. Yes. If John, if that's in reference, I'm just I'm just guessing that Dan might be asking about if there's a special event. Um, and I know that you're familiar with the special e e event permit process. If there is sort of, I guess, maybe uh, traffic management requirements, perhaps. I don't know. He might be asking that. I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, if there were to be a special event permit required, that's uh, the permit materials are reviewed by our police department um, and the police works out uh, any sort of details that they may have to be involved in uh, even beyond the approvals. I'm not sure if there is a, a charge for that or not. There is an application fee when one is required. Um, but as far as uh, any more detail on the police involvement or any kind of fees or charges involved with ser other services provided, um, I don't have the answer to that. Uh, you know, that's probably something that, uh, and again, Dan, if, if we've misunderstood the question, please clarify it. And we'll probably need to reach out to the police department to, to get you that answer. Great, um, The uh, next question is where, are the subtitles or closed captioning? Uh, Nathan, I think you you might have an answer for that one. I know that the city's been uh, working on certain provisions for accommodations for virtual meetings. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Um, thanks, Jenna. Um, I did email you. Um, I don't believe it was a week or two ago, um, directly answering this question. Um, we were not able, we're in the process of our communications team um, has taken this comment very seriously and we're trying to explore um, different virtual meeting software that might allow us to do uh, live closed captioning, which is what you were requesting. Um, unfortunately, you know, given that that request was made a month ago, um, you know, we have a lot of, it's, you know, it's a large impact because we're also looking at um, ways to do it for city council hearings and planning commission hearings as well and so they're they're working on it we were not able to get that um, up and running um, or find a, a solution for this meeting um, as i'd emailed you about but um there will be a um, just like last time i will send you um, a link to the youtube recording for this which has a closed captioning option uh, i apologize that it's not live closed captioning um, but it's the best system that we have in place now and I just appreciate your patience. Um, you know, in this virtual meeting and environment, it's kind of constantly shifting um, and we're getting better at it. And um, we're looking 
to do that going forward um, to better serve um, our citizens. So thank you. The uh, next is a question from Ginger Railsback. Uh, I apologize if I mispronounce that, Ginger. Um, only the meditation center was approved. How can you say both temple and meditation are allowed? Uh, Nathan, can you clarify the permitted uses? Yeah, yeah. Um, as I said in my in my intro, um, the uh, cover of the PDP lists the the allowed uses. Um, in, in addition to the single family home, the other use allowed is church use, which um, which matches the uh, granted antiquated wording that's in our current comp plan. We are updating that um, as we um, as we sort of speak now. But um, but the um, but our city attorneys. Um, had us use that wording of a church. It was the actual approved use. So the meditation center is really a is really what is a you know it's the sort of building that is being used for um, as a temple or for meditation practice. So um, whether it's a Christian church or a Buddhist uh, temple, um, those all fit under our current definition of church, which is a permitted use. So I hope I've answered that one. Okay. <laughs> Uh, the next question is also from Ginger. What size will the trees be when first planted? The rendering shows more than 30 feet. Yeah, Ginger, it's um yeah, when we it usually in renderings they are um they're um they're kind of shown you know more toward further growth. But I'll let um Will um if if you can kind of, kind of speak to the general size of evergreen trees. I, I can say that we do have minimum height requirements. Um, and sort of caliper inch requirements um, for those to establish, um, you, know, sc you know, screening at an early time and so that they're healthy trees. But, um, but Will, do you have a sort of a rough idea of, um, you know, what those, what you're, you're proposing for tree sizes at the onset? Yeah, um, yeah, I admit that, you know, the trees that are there um, are, you know, um, older growth trees, but um, we're working with the, uh, landscape um, architect to um, design that. And the, the first draft does have a combination of uh, earth berm and evergreen trees. Um, and there is a minimum height um, for, for that screenage um, so that um, cars and headlights are blocked from the parking lot. Um, so the, the ultimate design uh, will be more opaque than than even is, is shown in, in this image, um, especially at that, um, you know, three to four foot height. Um, I don't know Thanks, if that's well. question, yeah. Yeah, I think that does. And Ginger, also, just so that you know, these larger trees are existing trees, the ones that, um, I think you can see my cursor, that are over here on the right side. And a lot, there's a beautiful set of trees there, there now. I think Will's talking about the sort of addition of these other trees here that and shrubs again we're going to make sure that um, especially the um the uh, parking lot area is screened um so that no headlights are going to come through um you know those bushes are going to take a little bit to fill out but we'll um we'll ensure that that there's a dense planning we actually have a pretty pretty strong landscape code that speaks to that um so thank you Okay, the next is um, a question again from Ginger. Concerning the signage, what does for now mean? What has to happen to change this? Um, that was probably relative to something that was said along the time the comment was made, so I'm not sure exactly um, what exactly the question is referencing. Maybe some of the, uh, uh, maybe Nathan or, or the applicant might have an idea. Uh, well, I guess can you speak to that? Did you did you say anything for now? We did say that we would be um, applying our our new sign code to this project, and um, making sure that it meets those requirements, um, and that um, you know the applicant had had stated that he's not not proposing to do um, or anything. Which even if that you know were to happen, which would take a PDP amendment, um, which they're not they're not proposing to do. The signage on it would still be regulated um, to a certain maximum size and height. Um, so I don't know. Will does that? Do you think I? Do you think I got that, or do you have any other things uh, to add? That that may be um, 
in in reference to um, you know that maybe the archway um, and we're we're taking that off the table, but um, as as maybe Nathan you can explain better, um, you know any um, any accessory structures that aren't currently on the PDP would have to go back um, through an amendment process, um, and we're we're not proposing that at this point. Yeah, but the I think I think it's fair to say that the the property owner would have that right um, at any point um, uh, to to make those amendments, whether they would get approved or not, um, is another question. But um, you should be able to speak to that better. Yeah, well, you actually said it absolutely correct, so I don't have to add anything. If they do an amendment, um, that would need to it could be approved administratively. Um, you know, I think something like adding another accessory use um, would be something that we'd have to have to look at if it was, I'm sorry, an accessory structure. Um, and we've heard from this community pretty clearly that um, the archway is, is is not something that's highly desired. So, um, you know, we'd have to review that at the time it comes in. But right now, it doesn't it doesn't seem like something that um, that staff would um, be in be in favor of. Um, but certainly um, the applicant could ask for that. And if we felt it was necessary, we could um, ask them to um, take the application through city council to allow for public comment. All right, next is a question from Mike Lair. Uh, there is a property that was recently zoned commercial on the corner of 108th and Dover Street. When this property is developed, will the city and county require concrete curb and gutter? If so, why is the city and county in discussions with this applicant to allow a dirt path? Uh, this is likely in reference to the uh, southeast corner of uh, Wadsworth Parkway and 108th, and it would be bounded on the east side by Dover. Um, I'll probably defer this to Nathan Inc., but I, I can say there is some jurisdictional differences there. Um, Wadsworth, being uh, the jurisdiction of the state, 108th, I believe, is the city's jurisdiction. But Nathan, you may be able to confirm the status of Dover and kind of how we would approach that project. Yeah, um, I'm, I'll, I'll do my best here um, to answer here for uh, Heath Klein. Um, but you know, where we are evaluating um, that site um, at the pre-app stage, um, and we have. Um, identified a number of right-of-way improvements um and i and i do believe that uh curb and gutter is along dover street is something that we are pursuing with that um just in order for it to meet our cross sections and our typical cross sections as as they're um, identified in our standards and specs um and so that is that is where we have landed on that at this time, um, however, you know, speaking to the scale of that development um, and and comparing it to this, um, there is there's a lot of other things that are going on with that development um, across the board um, with many different disciplines. Um, so that that is an ebb and flow kind of development and site that we're we're working on um, with that application and that applicant or that landowner really um, to to see if we can get that. Um, <clears throat> that project moving forward, but at this time, um, there's nothing to, to really report on uh, what's going to be there and, and how it's going to be developed. All right, the uh, next question is from Shelley Gotis. You mentioned the most similar PDP designation was a, was a church. Why would it not be considered a school designation given the applicant is a teacher? Um, Shelley, I think, uh, Nathan's already addressed the permitted uses. Um, this is um, considered, you know, it's a religious organization and the, the city views the land use as most generally characterized as a church, regardless of who the applicant is. Um, Nathan, uh, do, you, do you have anything else to add to this one? No, I don't. I think you got it, John, thanks. Okay, okay. Uh, next question is from Ginger rails back. When will road improvement be finalized? Is it does and I assume that means the construction of the improvements? Yeah, I mean, I I can kind of just probably answer. Um, 
Yeah, so Ginger, the um, the sort of general layout of the road and the general grading will be, you know, quote unquote, finalized um, when the ODP is approved. Now that that'll just be a general layout. Um, so the roads and the sidewalks, really just grading um, and the sort of bounds and what the sidewalks are made of. Um, the the next step in the process is um, the civil engineering drawings, and that's where really all the uh, sort of details, the the uh, fine details, um, will be reviewed um, by Nathan Ink on that, um, and um, and um, and also the ODP will 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 be reviewed by Jeffco as well, and uh, those will be uh, constructed as part of um, of the permit associated with those civil drawings. So um, th those are the kind of steps. So we're just in the early design stage now. Um, so we're taking all, all of your feedback and incorporating it going forward, um, making sure that both um, Jeffco's requirements as well as the city's requirements um, are met going forward. So thank you. All right, the next comment is from Ginger also. No way is this consistent with the neighborhood. The percentage of use is not relevant in my mind. Next comment is from Shelley Goches. I agree with everything Ben stated. A uh, question from Ginger. Will overflow parking be screened? Yeah, Ginger, that's a good question. I, again, we're just, um, we weren't even really exploring the overflow parking idea until we heard it. Um, last month from, um, um, from the last community meeting. Um, there is no there's no requirement in the PDP to screen any sort of overflow parking because it's not mentioned. We only talk about the the, um, the permanent off street parking requirements. And I think it's pretty safe to say that the intent of the overflow parking is not to um, you know sort of formalize it. It, it. it would only be, and again, we still have to review this and vet it. Um, with um, various city staff, but the only, um, but I, I, I would not think it would be screened because the the end, the intent of true overflow parking would just be for the sort of occasional use again to prevent uh, parking on the street, which we've heard is, is not desired and um, is more of an eyesore. Okay, and this may have been answered, but Stan Mack asks, so where is the screening for the overflow parking then? I think I just answered that. Uh, Mr. Okay. Dorothy, I saw you I saw you come on. Would you like to make any to make a yeah. comment? Yes, thank you. Um, first I want to say about the overflow parking. Yes, we have no intent to make one overflow parking, but in case like I also have a right to apply for a special event permit sometime in the future. When that happened, before in that case, uh, to backup planning. And then we, as my neighbor uh, kind of requested previously, say that we should not park on the street, as Nathan earlier mentioned, you know, in that kind of concern and that reason. So we thought, you know, we want to make a, a backup planning if, when we have uh, special events with under special event permit. So then we also don't want to make anybody park on the street. So that way we want to respect what my neighbors requested. So in that reason, we try to prepare for the overflow parking since we have uh, plenty of space. Thank you. Thank you for that. That's actually helpful. I, I probably wasn't clear in that yeah, the overflow parking wouldn't be something like we formalized on the on the ODP. Um, it would just, again, as Mr. Georgie said, it would it'd be sort of um, part of the uh, generally as part of the special event permits. And and John can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, you know, we may we may require some sort of parking plan, and and in that plan could be could be a provision for overflow parking on site um, again to address the concerns of the neighborhood. Yes, that's correct, Nathan. Um, so the, the next question is from Gender Railsback. Uh, who does Charles and Nathan Inc. report to? Uh, Ginger, I can state that Nathan Inc. reports to Dave Losman, L-O-S-E, 
M-A-N. He is our city engineer. And Charles, I'll let you clarify who you report to, if you don't mind. Uh, sure. Uh, so I report to the assistant director of planning and zoning, Mike Schuster, for the county. Um, and the director of planning and zoning, uh, Chris, Chris O'Keefe. Okay, thanks, Charles. Uh, next is a comment from Vincent Harris. Both the county and the city should only allow normal public access pedestrian sidewalk that meets ADA standards is always required with public access ways. Why would the county and the city allow crusher fine style pedestrian path? That's inappropriate and expensive to maintain in years to come. Inappropriate suggestion to allow. Hey Charles, would you like to comment? Yeah, uh, so I think there's some miscommunication there. So the county um, hasn't approved it any crusher finds path um you know basically the status of the county's um review of the of the request for relief from um public improvements was you know that staff does not support not providing um sidewalk you know that that's that's the current status you know there was no approval of any kind of crusher finds path i mean i think that's kind of a a question that the applicant had to the county that hasn't really been resolved yet. Um, so, you know, nothing's been approved, you know, as far as crusher fines. And I, I think I mentioned earlier that speaking with other staff that, uh, you know, as far as the sidewalk requirements, you know, we, we kind of, we go by our, what our regulations state. And if you, so if you go to the transportation design and construction manual for the county, um, you know, we have, our templates uh, for local streets that you know we need to be met. Um, those don't specify the materials for the sidewalk or curb and gutter. Um, so I think that's where the confusion came from when that question came to me. And you know I said, well, I, we'd have to look at that. Um, and then, but I did find in the transportation construction manual when it when it talks about construction, it refers to uh, the CDOT MNS standards. And so that's why I mentioned earlier. Um, that we would probably um, be looking at um, the CDOT MNS standards, which I do believe that they do, um, you know, they do specify concrete sidewalks. Uh, and so that's probably what we would want to see. So sorry for the miscommunication. I, um, you know, I don't think there's any approval of any kind of crusher fines trail anywhere. I think we would want to um, see that, uh, that our requirements are met from, you know, as stated in our regulations. So. All right, thank you. Uh, the next is a question from Dan Henderson. Uh, this is something the applicant should uh, address. Uh, the question is, if the capacity of the 900 square foot garage is 45, what's to keep the applicant from having another 75 to 100 people outside watching the show on a TV screen? And, it, and it, I guess it's really a question of what what are your plans outside of the uh, meditation center, and would they include anything uh, like Dan suggesting here, a TV screen? You know, Will, can you can you speak to that? Um, um, that's a good idea, but I think um, as as we kind of discussed in the um, earlier in the presentation, we're, we're talking with the city um, that 45 occupant capacity is interior to the uh, meditation building, um, and then we're, we're discussing with the, the city to try to define specifically um, at what point above that 45 person capacity would trigger the requirement for a special permit, special event permit. Um, and that, I, I don't think we have a clear, 20, 25 person um, is, I, I believe the, um, 
the number uh, anything over 25 people is what triggers the uh, need for a special event permit. Um, so we're, we're still trying to define that. Um, and I don't know, Nathan, is, is that, um, will that be written into the ODP? I, I, I thought that you were talking that that may be um, explicitly written into the PDP just for clarification for uh, the organization and the neighborhood. So, yeah, Will, I, this is John I, and Nathan. I, I could probably answer this. Uh, yes, we we want to continue to work with the applicant to define under what conditions a, a special event permit would be required. A special event permit at, at the City of Westminster was really designed to encapsulate various city departments' rules and regulations regarding everything from uh, fun runs in our public spaces to street closures for parades and other events. As far as planning and zoning goes, uh, what we look to is our section 11.417 and that's temporary uses on private property. And it's typically geared toward um, things like Christmas tree sales and pumpkin patches or carnivals or things like that that are temporary in nature where something's being offered for sale, offered to be given away, uh, uh, including a good a service or amusement. So it's a, it's a pretty broad kind of um, uh, activity that we're looking at there. Um, uses like temples, meditation centers, churches and the like um, the city typically doesn't require uh, very often these types of special event permits for things that would normally go on at a church, like a picnic or whatever for their congregation. If the church, for example, or other similar organization was proposing to have a large festival, a big uh, convention or revival or something like that, uh, then that would probably start falling into the arena of the special event permit. So we'd like to continue to work with the applicant to really kind of hone in on what types of events that they anticipate they would have, the scale of them, and that would give the staff a little more insight as we move this forward as to what those thresholds should be. Ultimately, we would like to have enough clarity to provide some information in the official development plan to where all parties are clear, including the residents. So I, I hope that helps uh, answer the question there. Um, next is a comment from Dan Henderson. The drainage issue is a grave concern to the neighbors to the south. Uh, Next is a comment and I believe a question from Suzanne Kuhn. The slide rendered site plan reflects site key 11 as a water retention area, which appears to be a small pond with only a berm to the south. What is the offset to the adjoining property to the south? How will this be lined to ensure water is not seeping into the ground area? Given that this is placed direct north of another property structure, whose responsibility for damage should the retention pond fail? It sounds like a question for the applicant. Right, so um, this this was based off of the um, initial submittal as the ODP for the initial drainage plan that, that our civil engineer um, came up with. And we've since gotten good feedback from uh, the city and um, comments about that uh, drainage plan. Um, and one of the comments was they were not uh, keen on uh, utilizing uh, water detention area um, that was proposed. Um, and so uh, subsequ subsequently, we've been discussing utilizing various options on the site um, and, and um, Nathan might be able to speak to it more, but they, they could include um, grass swales or rain gardens 
various strategies so that we can avoid uh, having to use a uh, water detention area. So that, that portion um, will likely go away uh, and we'll use kind of more integral strategies on this further up on the site as that water gets um, uh, kind of taken care of as it as it moves. Nathan, Nathan may be able to speak to that more. Um, no, I, I think that uh, I mean it's an ongoing uh, design process that we're we're continuing to work work through and ensure that that there is no uh, negative impacts downstream from the development of this property. All right, thank you. I think the next question is about drainage as well. Um, but again, I think I think Nathan's comments um, address it. it. It's it's a work in a work in progress on what will be required for the final. Okay, yeah. The the next was um, a question from Dan Henderson. If drainage conveyance becomes an issue to the neighbors to the south, can they build berms to stop the conveyance? I think that's been addressed. So, okay, yeah, so, so I'm not sure how that question could be answered because um, I think so. I think conveyance of any drainage, you know, when I think of conveyance of any drainage, it's you know the wa that that water that's that storm water that's being released is either being piped through underground sewer infrastructure or it's being conveyed through some sort of channel some sort of swale like grass swale or something to a, ultimately to a uh, a larger reservoir say or a major drainage way which is located to the south here um, but any of that, basically to get, basically to allow that conveyance to even happen, for for that construction to even happen, you know, that there would need to be drainage easements that would have to be established, which would basically be agreements with those property owners that are being that are crossed. You know, like I can't go and I would be able to go dig a swale on my neighbor's property without their permission. I need their permission. So there's no there's no conveyance of flows onto your property um, without your permission, without some sort of drainage easement. So as far as the release of those flows, um, you know, I think there there are certain situations where um, you know we have detention ponds that outfall to an open area. Maybe it would be like the county's property. Um, and then basically the, the intent of that would be that it would eventually infiltrate into the ground natural as it naturally would if it, during a normal rainstorm uh, anywhere, you know, the, the water isn't, would, you know, naturally infiltrate into the ground and dissipate and go where it needs to go. And so, you know, with that, maybe we would want to see like a flow spreader so that it would spread out any kind of concentrated flow to allow that um, infiltration to occur over a wider area but you know I don't th I think yeah I, I understand the concern um, with the property to the south and I think so that's kind of where um, this whole um, design these other design alternatives are being explored now because you know we understand that you know any conveyance of, of water through the properties to the south is obviously going to require some sort of permission, some sort of drainage easement. Otherwise, you know, the developers design in their design, they're going to need to explore other options. So I hope hopefully that alleviates your concerns and um, in knowing that, you know, the county and the city, we do look at that. That is part of what we are reviewing. Um, that is part of what our regulations um, are there for. So and if, if I could just uh, comment quickly too, um, based on our last conversation, um, our design goal for drainage, um, and, and, and Nathan may be able to, to speak to it 
um, as well as is our, our goal and, and what we'll be working with our civil engineer is to um, eliminate the need for off-site conveyance. So our, our design goal for drainage is to um, uh, all, all development and, and drainage strategies will be kept on site um, if possible. Um, and, and Nathan needs more information before he can kind of determine if that's possible. But in our conversations, it seemed like that that's very likely that we can employ various strategies on site um, to eliminate the need of any off site conveyance. Am, am, am I correct? Nathan. Yes, ab absolutely. That's that's the goal. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, the next is a uh, comment from Bernard Gochis. Um, now that we have the open space trails in, um, the next is a uh, question from Suzanne Kuhn. What measures are in place to ensure that this does not become a mosquito infested area? Um, I guess mosquitoes aren't quite my area of expertise, but I think as we've talked about, um, I, I think there were, the applicant has agreed and, and Nathan's been, been suggesting some ideas for um, not, you know, not um, detain the water. I think that the, the, the real, Concern that comes up with mosquito infest infestations deals with a retention pond, and I'm, I might be stepping outside of my lane here, Nathan. So, um, so, so correct me, but um, there's no there's no intent here to to make a retention pond. And in, in fact, we want to really allow the water to infiltrate into the ground as, as quickly as possible. Hope I had hope I did it right there, Nate. Yeah, no, and kind of to, to go off of that, um, you know, the state law also regulates uh, how long you can detain water. Um, and so, um, you know, looking at that, the water quality capture, depending on the type of infrastructure you're using, um, that that retention time is a maximum of um, 12 hours um, with, with the products that we're exploring. Um, so that is the amount of time that you'd have any sort of water before it infiltrated in or um, was dissipated across the, the site. Um, so, you know, in that amount of time, that, that's not something that we would be too concerned about um, creating an environment that would breed mosquitoes um, in, in this, in the, the instances that were the alternatives that we're exploring um, for the ultimate engineering design. All right. Thank you. Uh, next question is from Dan Henderson. How do we apply for a request from relief from the meditation center? Um, Dan, it, it sounds like you may be asking uh, how to uh, potentially uh, appeal the decision of the city council to allow the, the use. That, that could be the question. If, if we're wrong, please feel free to clarify us. Um, I don't know that I have an answer on the appeal process of city council actions for you tonight. If we can, uh, Jennifer, if you can just mark that one as uh, to allow us to revisit that and we can provide an answer and, and put that on our uh, Q&As on the, on the website. And Dan, I'm sorry if that's, if that's the wrong interpretation of your question, please let us know. And, and we'll try to answer it uh, more clearly. Uh, next is from Suzanne Kuhn. In the last meeting, the comment was made that grassland to the south would be able to handle the water runoff. However, that land is not simply grassland, but rather people's yards. The city and county need to ensure the water drainage is not simply allowing excess water to ruin the adjoining properties. Uh, Thank you for the comment, Suzanne. Uh, Marsha Hooker asks why trails along Balsam? I think that's been answered. Is Am I correct when I say that? I think we addressed the sidewalk versus trails question. Yes, we did. Okay. Um, next is a comment from Shelly Goches. I would also like to see a berm to the north of the parking lot. Um, next is from Jana Railsback. We are not allowed to have a home business, so there are not signs in this neighborhood. 
therefore it does not fit into the neighborhood. Okay, next is uh, from Dan Henderson. Are you going to address any questions or comments or are you all, all just going to pontificate? You know, Stan, we're, we're really trying to address the questions and comments. Uh, please bear with us. Uh, next is from Ginger Railsback. Will the entire property be fenced as depicted? Good question. I'll let the applicant address that. Um, I think, yeah, the, the intention is to provide some uh, fencing along uh, 106 and, um, and Balsam. Um, there is uh, um, restrictions on fencing heights with, um, within the front setbacks. Um, so anything that would be proposed or finalized um, would uh, conform to those requirements. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, the next is from Shelly Gochis. What, what are the dimensions of this unresidential looking sign? Uh, for, first, I'll, I'll just clarify, uh, like Nathan said earlier, we haven't reviewed a, a, a sign permit yet. I think what the applicant's showing here is potential concepts uh, that they believe would comply with our code, but it may be a good question to ask the applicant the uh, images that you're showing in your presentation uh, generally, what size do you think those signs are that that you may be proposing? Right. Yeah. So that was that was just a kind of conceptual sign based on the Westminster Signage Code for a post type sign, um, and the requirements for that type of sign is a six foot um, height maximum, um, a total square footage of twelve square feet for that for the actual sign. Um, and the sign needs to be set back, um, I believe, three feet, three to five feet um, from the property line. Um, and so that was a kind of a conceptual sign showing those parameters um, so, so we could um, at least have a discussion about it. All right, thank you. Uh, next is from Jenna Railsback. At this point, you are taking it off the table. So pretty much in the future, we will have to revisit this apparently. Um, Jenna, I think that might have to do with um, uh, possibly that, that entryway arch. Uh, does anybody want to address this or is it clear enough? I, I think we've addressed that one a few times. So I think it's clear. OK, OK, thank you. OK, Vincent Harris. Uh, Ask Nathan, explain the sign code allowance in terms of size allowed, height allowed, setback allowed, and type of materials. Specifics, not general comments. Vincent, um, I'll speak, I'll jump in here for Nathan. We don't have the sign code in front of us. It's a brand new code. We're all just learning it right now. We'll be happy to um, review that and answer your, your questions with more specificity, but we just don't have that in front of us right now. It would take us a little bit to kind of go through it and answer your questions. We're happy to do that. And, and I think it's best if we uh, review that against your questions and then answer them and we'll put, publish those online with the other answered questions. And uh, we apologize for just, you know, not having that knowledge off the top of our heads tonight, but it's a brand newly adopted ordinance. So we hope you understand. Uh, yeah, and, next and, is, and Jennifer, if you could mark that one as well, I, I haven't written down, but yeah, we'll get the exact code citation for you, Vincent. Um, uh, so you can have that for what's allowed um, in a residential, a, a low density residential area so, such as this. Yeah, thanks everybody. Uh, and next is from Sh Shelly Gochis. If you don't know the size of the sign that is proposed, what are the limitations set by City of Westminster for size of signage in a residential neighborhood? Yes, Shelley, we're gonna we're gonna answer those questions, uh, especially in in terms of specificity that that Vince has outlined above your questions. So thank you. Um, next is from Jenna Railsback. 
you never address the fact that there is one bathroom with all those people. What are the city requirements for this? Um, Nathan, you, you might have some insight into that from our initial building division review. Um, it, do you have any insight into that? I know we don't have anybody from our building division here tonight. Yeah, um, it's a good question. Uh, we did review that like a year ago. So I'm trying to remember, Will might be able to help, but um, certainly the um, as this garage is being converted um, and changing use, it will have to conform with um, the, um, the International Building Code as far as uh, ADA access, so certainly the bathroom there will need to provide ADA access and the number of, um, of stalls um, um, will also be required, um, will be governed by the, the IBC. Um, I can't recall exactly if, what the requirements were for 45 people. I don't know, Will, do you have any recollection if there's a bathroom that needs to be added? Um, it's, just, it's just been so long. Um, I, I believe, um, I, I believe under 50 for this occupancy type, um, only requires one, um, ADA, one restroom that also has to be, um, accessible. Um, and that's, that's what we're, that's what we'll be proposing, you know, um, proposing, uh, at the building, um, uh, department submittal. Those, those details will be fleshed out, um, per the IBC, um, during those submittals, but yeah, that's that's what we're we'd be proposing. Just one rest, one accessible restroom. Okay, great. Th thank you, Will. That's that sounds right. Okay, the uh, next is a question from Mike Laird regarding the. I think we've already answered this exact question a little bit earlier. It's about the yeah. uh, curb and gutter on 108th and Dover, the commercial development. Um, Looks like a repeat. Uh, uh, and this next one is the same thing. Okay, so we've answered both of, uh, or that same question already earlier. Uh, thanks, Mike. Um, Vincent Harris asked, your answers to these questions say the answer was verbally said. I assume you and staff will also write the answers down to provide a record of the answers, correct? Uh uh, Vincent, this recording will be provided. Um, um, so whatever questions are answered in this meeting will be required, um, will be um, um, provided via that, that link to a YouTube a, uh, a, a site that will be posted to the project website. And I'll be emailing all of you um, who've, who've been participating tonight with that link. Any questions that, um, um, we've skipped over, or not skipped, but we couldn't answer tonight. Um, there were there were two that I have so far, um, as well as any questions that we don't get to. Um, it looks like we're running up on time. We're about five minutes away. Um, anything that's left over will be um, will be uh, a written uh, answers to those comments and questions will be posted on that same web page. So. Again, um, you know, within probably uh, you know a week or two, depending on the com on the complexity of, of the questions, those answers will be posted to the site. Um, but otherwise, this recording um, will serve as the um, as the documentation of the meeting. And and Vincent, I just copied and pasted the URL for the project status webpage that Nathan mentioned for for this case. And that's the you can use that link, and that's where you can get to the uh, the the recording of this meeting. Um, next is from Bernard Gochis. Is the city pushing for any amenities for the community? We want this to blend in with the colors of the community, similar to the Walmart and Evergreen. Looks like it belongs as an example. Toning down the exterior colors will help community acceptance. Um, I think that's probably a question. Uh, really, maybe the applicant can help answer there. Uh, I know that the uh, architectural design and color had some significance to the to the use. So it may be helpful for the applicant to help address that as well. 
and yes, the, the city does want to try to strike a balance and fitting in with the neighborhood character. Uh, but also we, we do recognize that um, based on what we've learned from the applicant, some of the architectural features and maybe some of the colors may have some significance to the use. So I'd like for the, again, the uh, applicant to address that. Yeah, Rinpoche spoke to this a little bit in the, the first meeting, um, just the significance of the, the colors um, shown um, are not arbitrary. Um, and so I'll, I'll defer to him um, to quickly just um, touch on the significance of the, the colors as they're shown. Rinpoche, could you, you speak a little bit to uh, the design and the color um, as it's represented here? Yes. Um, earlier, I have mentioned about a uh, little bit on that color. Uh, yes, the color is very important for uh, like Buddhist, Buddhist, Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, red and yellow presenting the love and uh, compassion and wisdom. Uh, so kind of every different, different faith have their own different ornaments on their churches and temple. So just like that, we have those kind of color thing. And then this whole explanation, if you, uh, it will be a long kind of explanation right now if I try to give you, but I uh, can give you, if anyone who are interested, I can actually, as earlier Nathan mentioned, I can put everything post on that website or anywhere you want i can put that there as a solid record so that you can read yes uh, then also in the end before this whole event end i would like to say some words but not i want to wait a little bit so yes all right thank you uh the next is a question from shelly goches the applicant or comment, the applicant may not be responsible for dealing with the historic flooding and this property 8200 has not flooded. The additional hard surfaces the applicant creates will add more flow to the neighbors to the south. The next is from Stan Mack. Hours of operation should be zero. We are not allowed to have a home business so there should not be any others allowed but since this is obviously favoritism and we had to had no say then Monday through Friday, nine to five with no weekend events. Uh, the next is from Jana Railsback. Uh, it's just a statement, go Dan with lots of exclamation points. Um, the next is from Suzanne Kuhn. In relation to the answer given for Stan's concern of overflow parking, your response is 21 spaces minimum based on code for the expected occupancy. Is the occupancy limit going to be held at 45 as stated when the uh, council uh, approved? And I think that occupancy is for the building, but uh, if the applicant uh, would like to address that, pl please feel free to. Um, yeah, that, um, that 45 um, occupant maximum is um, just a, a straight calculation based on square footage and um, use. Um, so that's that's uh, uh, an explicitly um, uh, num explicit number that comes directly from the code. Um, so that that's where that maximum maximum occupancy for the um, meditation building comes from. Great, thank you. Um, so we're running up on time. It's eight o'clock right now. Um, so again, thank you all for your comments tonight. Um, I've just put up my contact info on the screen. Again, here's the URL um, for the Project Status webpage. I'll also email that out uh, to you all. Um, and on that page, again, we will uh, answer. There were a couple of questions earlier that, that we couldn't answer um, without some further research. And it looks like there's uh, about 10, 15 or so uh, questions that uh, we did not get to tonight. So we will uh, be posting answers to those to the website. 
um, within you know, a week or two. And, um, and uh, again, I appreciate all of your input tonight. This has been uh, helpful once again. Um, we, we have a lot of input here and um, we will take your input and um, incorporate it into the future submittals of the official development plan for, um, for this project. So again, thank you all um, for coming um, and showing up tonight and uh, have a good evening. Uh, hello, Nathan, I'm sorry. Can I say a few, a few things for, give me one minute, is that all right? Uh, sure, go ahead. Thank you so much. I would just try to go quick. Um, uh, first, I just want to say that uh, uh, there are lots of questions. I was just keeping some notes, which are some important for me to say. And then thank you very much for this time that having their own names, that all those who asked questions, that was very helpful. And then, yes, I will follow and honor the law of this land and also the, whatever the decisions the city officers they make, I definitely uh, hold in my heart and I will follow. And then whatever the rights, if the city officers and then the law of this country give me as a, a citizen of this land, citizen of this country, I will fully exercise my rights as my human right and religious freedom. And also, uh, uh, there were some comments I have seen, on, I haven't seen, but I have heard somebody told me, uh, saying uh, there are lots of people who probably get a misunderstanding thinking that I'm a Chinese or something. Uh, somebody comment as a Chinese restaurant, some stuff like that. Uh, I want to tell you very clearly, I'm not Chinese, I'm a Tibetan. But, uh, and then, uh, so I'm also a citizen of the United States. Uh, so this is not a restaurant and this is our Buddhist temple, church. Um, and also, uh, was many questions came the sign and then I, in one hand uh, if you if the city is giving me saying that okay I'm a uh, this is a church and then this is something like a business or industry accordingly I have to put this kind of sidewalk and so all these kind of requirements that it come on me and then likewise I believe I will have the right to put every churches have the sign so why not a Tibetan Buddhist temple should also have the sign too, since that's kind of also, I feel like very fair to have me the uh, kind of uh, right to put the sign of my temple. And also, uh, yes, church, temple, meditation center, that all means the same thing for a Tibetan. So that way, this is temple. And also, uh, the lastly, I wanna say, uh, now all these difficult times is passed away, passed and gone. And then thank you very much. And also there are uh, some number of people from my neighbor reached me and they are very much uh, kind of interested to know me more or they want to have some time, cup of tea or something like that. Uh, that gesture was so beautiful that really touched me. And then uh, generally all my neighbor, I know we are all human. It's only just we are we have some misunderstanding. We want to know more each other. And I'm just like you, one of you, and then we will be very good friend in the future. And then if you people who have difficult time, I'm so sorry, I cannot do anything, but I have to follow whatever the law gives me the right, I must do that. But, and then whoever wants to uh, like kind of in the future open with making friendship. Now pandemic is over very soon. And I really am really excited to meet you all sometime and we will be very good friends. Thank you very much for everybody. And then you all have a good night and a sweet dream. And also may all this pandemic be over and healthy and happy for everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Georgie. Um, everyone have a, have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone.